be here. Thank, thank you for having us. Like we have prepared a great uh, workflow presentation for you all today. But first off, uh, just to, to kind of start on who who we are, uh, as Megan said, I'm Tomas. I'm a partner solutions architect at Sneak. And then co-presenting with me today, I have Tom Gibson and Ryan Pedersen. I'll let them kind of quickly introduce themselves. Before we so, hi everyone. My name is Tom Gibson. Um, as Megan and, and Tomas have said at the stage, uh, I'm a senior staff engineer at CloudSmith. Um, I've been with the company around about two years or so, and uh, I work to sort of lead the engineering teams within CloudSmith, uh, do uh, some of the webinar type stuff we're on today, uh, and work to further the, the engineering roadmap. So nice to be here. Uh, really excited to, to get going. Great. And I'm Ryan Pedersen, a senior solutions engineer at Circle CI. I've uh, been with the company about a year and a half. Um, in my role it just means I get a helped teams adopt CI and CD best practices and allow for uh, rocket ship emoji growth. I love the rocket ship emoji. Yeah, <laughs> thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Tom, for, for being here and co-presenting this with us. Uh, for the audience, we prepared a, an awesome presentation that you know shows how we can together help construct a secure software supply chain. Uh, but before we jump into the, the meat of this presentation, the demo, just a little bit about you know who these three companies are that are coming together. So from the sneak side, we've been around since about 2015, uh, gone through five rounds of funding. We're used by over 2.2 million developers worldwide. And our mission is to put into those developers' hands the tools that they need to take security of their applications into their own hands and you know, help turn security into a team exercise that everybody owns. So from the sneak side, we'll be talking about security. And then CloudSmith. Awesome, thanks Tomas. So uh, Clyde Smith uh, founded uh, 2017 uh, in Belfast in, in Northern Ireland. So you'll, you'll have to excuse my accent. Um, so we, uh, we operate to um, essentially enable our customers to do continuous packaging. And you'll hear us talk a little bit about this further on in the webinar, but um, we offer a, a package delivery network in order to help um, speed up um, package downloads and uploads, all that kind of stuff. But our primary mission is ultimately to help people secure their supply chains. Um, we offer uh, universal repositories. So uh, they cover virtually all of the formats that people use today uh, across all of the biggest organizations. You can see some of those on the bottom slide, uh, such as MyOB, Font Awesome, Shopify, a bunch of others as well. Uh, it's a 24 seven product, it's SaaS based, it's entirely uh, cloud native. So I'll hand over now to Ryan to talk a little bit about Circle. Great. Thanks, Tom. Uh, so at Circle CI, we help high-performing teams, all types of industries, different points in their trajectories. Um, and we bring some of these points up really just we've hundreds of customers, thousands of customers that run millions of builds per day. Uh, we've seen it all highly flexible in terms of what things people can do on the platform. So developers come onto Circle CI really to just reduce workflow duration, increase deployment frequency, and reduce mean time to recovery. To put that a, it's a more simple way: deploy more code, get feedback faster, and troubleshoot more quickly. Awesome. We'll get on to the presentation. Yeah, thank you, Ryan and Tom. So before we jump into the demonstration, just a real quick overview of what we're going to be showing you today. We're going to cover all these points that we've mentioned in the introduction. Continuous everything, right? So this includes integration and delivery, security, as well as packaging. We're going to wrap this all into a demo and kind of show you what it all looks like in action. So before we jump into the good stuff, just to walk you over what it is we're going to be showing you without stealing too much thunder from the demonstration. Uh, so you've probably, if you've heard about shifting left, it's this concept of introducing security testing earlier into the development workflow. So if we think of the life cycle of an application, it's about testing the application as it gets written. And then also testing it after code is checked into the source control system to ensure that no new vulnerabilities can be introduced. But there's a couple of extra steps that need to happen for an application to go from code and concept to production. And so that's where Circle CI comes in, uh, where a build is, is triggered to package and get our application deploy ready. So Ryan, can you walk us a little bit about what we're going to be seeing today uh, from a Circle CI perspective? 
Absolutely. And again, without giving too much away, um, well, Circle CI, I guess it's pretty evident, is in the business of continuous integration and delivery. It, it's right in the name. Uh, we can think of that really as just the change validation for developers who are committing code. Uh, and good CI enables the business to be more nimble and to meet customer needs faster. What we'll be seeing in the demo today is just how Circle CI is used to coordinate the work that needs to be done as a change passes from early stages when it's triggered to the point where it's ready to get into the hands of customers. And then I'm going to pass it off to Tom to talk a bit more about the CloudSmith and continuous packaging piece. So thanks, Ryan. Uh, so yeah, today we're going to be uh, talking a little bit um, uh, further about continuous packaging. We see is in essence the glue between continuous integration, continuous security, and continuous delivery. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about uh, repository structure best practices and how you can help mitigate against dependency confusion attacks uh, and focus a little bit on uh, distribution to your teams, uh, services, and customers as well. Beautiful. Thank you all. So again, not to steal too much thunder from the demonstration, but we're going to be showing you how all this fits coherently to ensure that the applications that are being deployed into a production environment whether it's a containerized application, a serverless function, or an application running on an application server in a VM. We hope to demonstrate some of, some of these security best practices and how you can build workflows that where validation happens naturally as part of the workflow. So with that, it is time to tempt the demo gods and let's show all this in action. So, Starting uh, off with the application we're going to be demonstrating, the application with the coolest name ever uh, that Tom shared with us. This is, uh, we're calling it the waffle application, more specifically the sturdy waffle. And this is a Python, a Python application uh, that, you know, we're going to be running through Circle CI to build. And in that Circle CI workflow, we're going to see how that application, as Brian mentioned, how that application is taken from concept into a packageable artifact. And this is constructed using a Circle CI config.yaml file. So, Ryan, do you want to kind of walk over real quick what this config file does and how it translates into instructions for Circle? Absolutely. Yeah. So, everything we're going to see, um, again, another sneak peek later in the UI is set up here in source control. Uh, it's a config file under the .circle CI directory that we're looking at. And it has the instructions and logic for what to validate on each trigger. Um, it's all set up here. So each time Circle CI kicks off work and it follows the instructions there. Uh, the mandatory piece is you see a job stanza here. Uh, and there's also an orb stanza that was above. Orbs we'll get into, but again, just a little hint. They're great for extensibility and best practices. Uh, and then a workflow stands at the bottom. Um, so we'll dig into what those really are, but those are the main pieces of the of the config file and it, we'll see how it all mirrors into the UI. Yeah, and that's a that's a perfect transition over to the to the Circle CI UI uh, where we where we have our pipelines. So Ryan, can you just walk us over what it is that that we're seeing here? Absolutely. Um, so we are in the Circle CI UI, the all pipelines page. And a pipeline is the full set of workflows and the parameters run when work is triggered into Circle CI. So um, you can just think of it as that full config file that we just saw with all of the surrounding context. Um, Ryan, just just on that, actually, yeah, I was, I was just gonna ask a question actually on that. <laughs> um, just just what, what are the best ways, like, what are the, the ways in which pipelines can be triggered then? Yeah, excellent question. Uh, the pipelines are triggered on any action like a new commit, a tag, a PR through the API. And there's also a, a button in the UI to be able to, to trigger those. Um, in a sneak peek, you can also look for additional native triggers that are coming up in the coming quarters as well. Awesome. Cool. And then, awesome. and Tom, do you want to jump into that, uh, that workflow? Perfect, yeah, way ahead of me. <laughs> and then, so under a pipeline, um, a workflow is just the orchestration of jobs, which jobs are running and in which order. And the jobs are a set of commands, specified environment. And what we're seeing this, these here is a, uh, they're each their own independent ephemeral environments spun up on demand to the specs in the config file and then torn down after. 
Uh, they each have their own set level of vertical scale. So CPU and RAM just to match what's needed for that job specifically. Uh, the environments can be Docker, Linux, Mac, Windows, or a custom hosted runner. Awesome. And Brian, you mentioned something interesting, a custom hosted runner. Can you yeah. tell us a, a little bit about what that, what that is? What is a custom hosted runner? Who would need that? Yeah. Yeah. So it's, um, it's a go binary you can install if you want to, um, you know, we have cloud resources that are available, absolutely scalable for you, but there are a couple, I think, reasons that people might also raise their hand to use a self-hosted runner. Uh, one would be exotic compute requirements. Uh, I love saying exotic, like I'm describing a jungle cat, um, but it's, uh, you know, our execution environments cover the vast majority of use cases, but if there is something really specific you need to run on, it's perfect for that. And then sometimes security protocols. So if you, you know, can only access production environments or behind a firewall, for instance, or if you have some other protocols, um, you can use those for specific jobs that are part of the core workflow. Awesome. And so we're seeing here, the, this is a workflow and then the, each yeah. of these are, are the jobs within that workflow yes. defined by the, by the config file, yes? Yeah, yes, exactly. And we can jump in perfect ahead of me yet again. See, I got you. <laughs> and then, and um, so we're seeing a fail job here. Of course, we want everything to be green, but in reality, you know, that's what we're here to talk about is how to fix things outside the happy path. Uh, and then a, a job is, really it's just a set of commands in an execution environment that you specify. So you can absolutely, when in doubt, set your environment, run the exact steps needed to validate you know, what you want inside of that environment. Um, and if you want to do it all in bash using CLIs, you can 100% do that and you're off to the races. Uh, one other note before I pass it off to Tom though. So there's an, another piece that we're also here to talk about. Um, in reality, most people don't want to write everything out in bash in each config, uh, really want to utilize the best practices and uh, simplify the processes. So orbs are circle CI's tooling to help establish processes, configuration as code, and, and you can think of them as circle CI's package manager. We have certified partner orbs with great teams like Sneak and CloudSmith. Uh, and with these orbs, you can not worry about reinventing the wheel. The best practices are built in, helps you simplify your configuration. So just think many lines of code, combing through docs to figure out what to write, simplified into a single or a few lines of code, and plug and play commands, full jobs, maintained by CircleCI or the partners, uh, and you know they're up to date and version. And perfect segue to actually hand us off and talk about some orbs and ways to, to use them. Yeah, thank you, Ryan. So just uh, what we're seeing here then, uh, going back to the Circle CI YAML file, we you know kind of gave a sneak preview of that, but here are the two orbs that are in use as part of our workflow right now. And these orbs are used in the jobs that we ran, which each of these lines represent. And what we're seeing here, the failing job is actually an invocation of the sneak orb, where as part of the CI pipeline, we're in this particular case, uh, testing to see if there are any vulnerabilities in the open source components utilized by the Sturdy Waffle application. So sneak, sneak the, the whole idea here is just an extension of that, that shifting left. Yes, we wanna put security into developers hands, but it's still important to integrate security testing because developers are human or new vulnerabilities might be disclosed where for an open source component that a developer was using. And when it runs through the CI pipeline, what we're doing here is just testing, making sure that we're preventing issues from entering our production environment. Question on my end, um, do all the types of security tests have to run at the same time? See, Ryan, that's a, that's a good question because Sneak supports testing the open source. We can test the built container image. We can test the, the, the proprietary code that's part of the application and the infrastructure as code. Short answer, no. We do not need to run all the tests at the same time. Case in point right here, we're only testing if our open source dependencies have vulnerabilities before we build our application. So that's a, that's a great question. So in this case, now, let me zoom in a little bit for the, the viewers in the audience. Well, the, the orb that invoked the sneak CLI, in this case, failed the job because we have an issue in one of our eight dependencies 
there's one issue in the Jinja package that is used by our application where version 2.11.2 is, is introducing a regular expression denial of service vulnerability that can be fixed by upgrading to Jinja 2.11.3. So we can, when we set up this orb, we can actually see a reflection of the vulnerability within the sneak user interface. So when you import the GitHub repository where this application is currently hosted in the sneak, it constructs a representation of, oh, here's our requirements.txt file. And if we go into the sneak user interface, we can see that exact same vulnerability that was identified in the Circle CI workflow. And from here, uh, as a developer, we can choose how we want to take action. Do I want to manually upgrade this to Jinja 2.11.3? Do I want to ignore this vulnerability? Or do I want to have sneak help uh, fix this for me by creating a pull request? In this case, because we have a broken pipeline and we want to make sure that, you know, we can resume our builds and get our application pushed as fast as possible, we're going to have sneak open a pull request on, on our behalf, which is going to bump up that version of Jinja from 2.11.2 to 2.11.3. Awesome. And question for me actually was for doing that, Tomas, um, yeah. like, can we configure, is there, is there a way to configure like the tolerances? of the sneak orb itself so that you can sort of open the range and, and say, well, I want to allow some things through or I want to reject, like if we got controls on that. Absolutely. So within the configuration uh, of the sneak orb in the circle CI YAML, uh, you can definitely pass in what we call the severity threshold, where you can choose what the level of acceptable risk is that you want to allow introducing into your code base. So in this case, this is a medium severity vulnerability. So it is totally possible to add into the Circle CI or uh, instructions. Like, yeah, only fail my build if there are any high severity issues or higher. So in this case, though, uh, we have it failing on all severities, which is why this medium severity issue uh, failed our build. But now we've merged this fix into the into the the repository and which will be received by, by Circle CI, and then Tom will kick off another build by pushing another tag. And what we should see is that the sneak orb will now allow the pass to allow the task to pass. So while while that workflow runs though, because uh, it, it does take a, a little bit of time to re retest, it's a I think it's a good chance to, you know, to verify, to talk about what it is that CloudSmith is doing here uh, to ensure the, the art of both the artifacts we're using in our build, but also the artifacts we're publishing uh, come from a known trusted good source. So while that runs, Tom, you want to take us through a little bit about what CloudSmith is doing here in this pipeline? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much, Tomas. So you can see in the on the uh, in the run within Circle CI, we're in the process of building uh, a Debian package based upon of that that Python application, and the process then will be to push that up to CloudSmith. So thumbs up, it looks like it's doing the right thing. It's nice to see <laughs> within a demo, always a good thing to do. Um, but I would I'd like to talk a little bit just about um, repository layout then within CloudSmith and and I guess best practices perhaps, and, and, and ideas for how uh, you can best structure your assets uh, and strategies and techniques that you can use in order to strengthen your supply chain. So Tomas, would you mind uh, showing the repo list again? Um, so first off in the, the list, you, you see the app repository. So the app repository in this case is, is where we perform continuous packaging. We're, we're constantly producing new versions of this uh, application and pushing this up to CloudSmith. What happens when it goes into that uh, is is open. You know, we can trigger off uh, other workflows, uh, perhaps using webhooks. We can perform actions based upon that. We can enrich the information within that as well. Um, a couple of other repositories worth mentioning at this point. Um, we have uh, first off the the different environment repositories, um, and so we're going to talk here a little bit about a staging repository and a production repository as well. Tom, quick question, cutting in. Um, yeah. What kind of stuff can you store in a repo? Um, like, can they, do they have to be all the same format? Um, no, that's a, that's a great question. Um, we like to try and leave that up 
to our users. Ultimately, uh, they're their best place to make those decisions. So we currently support around about 25 formats, uh, give or take a margin uh, off the top of my head. It's, it's changing rapidly, but it's ultimately about empowering our users to have the flexibility and freedom to, to structure their repositories in the ways in which they feel fit and make sense to them and their deployments. So one of the best practices that we advocate in this case is to use um, keep your assets organized by environment. So in this case, for example, we've got a staging repository and uh, a production repository, both of which reflect uh, your different environments in a, in a traditional setting. Um, this allows you to kind of think of things and approaches to, to promote things across a pipeline. So within a staging repository, for example, we can put assets in there. Uh, we can uh, perform tests against there. So we could call out to sneak, for example, if we pushed a Docker image up, we could call out to sneak and perform a vulnerability scan. Uh, we could perform end-to-end -end testing, perhaps some smoke testing, API testing, whichever really makes sense for the application. Um, and then sort of once everything has been signed off, once we're, we're thumbs up, it's all looking good, we can then promote those assets into the releases repository. And that whole process is, is, is in essence, what we like to call uh, continuous packaging. There is an element of this then that sort of talks about, well, applications are built, right? They, they have dependencies. So I'll talk a little bit about that now in the dependencies repository. So Tomas, if you would mind uh, bringing that up for me. Um, and I'll, thanks very much. And we'll talk a little bit about what's going on here. You know, first off, you might ask, well, why would you keep your dependencies in CloudSmith? Um, ultimately boils down to trust and visibility. Um, you know, having a single 10 foot view of what's going into your software, it helps inform you of your, uh, your bill of materials, your software bill of materials. You know, manufacturing has had this like nailed for years. You know, if I, I pick up my iPhone, right? Uh, not to discredit other, other phones exist, they're all very good. Um, this particular phone, we have a screen, we have a chassis, we have a main board. I personally don't know the components that go into this, but you can be rest assured that the manufacturer does. So they have a list of all of the components. They know that uh, the main board may be sourced from Foxconn, the, the display may be sourced from Samsung or LG. And that information is retained by the manufacturer. They're fully aware of everything that's going to go into that product. And so software should be no different. Um, you know, We've gotten to a stage now where, where tools such as CloudSmith and others are getting to a point where they're really helping facilitate that visibility of what's going into a product. And ultimately it's about um, assertion that we, we're, we are fully aware of where our stuff is coming from, where our dependencies are coming from and validating that it is what it says it is. And we do that through the use of upstream proxying um, and, and signing keys attributed to the repositories as well. So you can prioritize upstreams. Um, let, ultimately you fetch a package um, if it exists in the local repository, it's served out first. Otherwise, it can fall through to upstreams and, and be served. Uh, and there is a priority to those. So you're able to fetch from the local and then upstream number one and then upstream number two and so on. It's um, interesting uh, that you mentioned upstreaming. Is that related to this uh, very hot topic that we he constantly hear about called dependency confusion? Is that related? Yes, yes. So bingo, <laughs> bang on. I, let, let, let's take a hypothetical situation. So we have Bob at Hooli, right? Bearing no resemblance to any fictional companies that you may have heard about. Um, but, you know, Bob has been in the company for a long time, you know, three, four, five years. He didn't get a promotion for the third year run, and he's getting quite jaded about this, very disgruntled. Bob leaves the company. Um, but with that walks out a lot of the knowledge of the internal systems of Hooli. So, you know, Bob is, is fully aware that they have a Python stack that, you know, they have packages internally called Hooli middleware and Hooli comms, et cetera. And so ultimately, you know, Bob, Bob could be in a position where either he wants to inflict harm upon the company um, or he could sell this information to someone who wishes to act upon it. And so uh, the, the, the process is quite simple. You know, you can create um, a package named exactly the same as an internal package, upload this to a, a public upstream such as PyPy, and all of a sudden, Hooli CI at some stage could potentially pull that into the environment. And so through use of, of services such as CloudSmith that enable you to have that layer in between, we can actively help prevent that. We can ensure that when requests are made for that particular asset, that they're serving out the asset that has been uploaded directly with CloudSmith rather than any external untrusted sources. Awesome, thank you, Tom. 
So if we flip back to Circle CI, we should have given it enough time to complete our workflow. We can see that the test that previously failed uh, succeeded this time. And because that test succeeded, it proceeded with the rest of the workflow. We now have built and published our, De our Debian package into CloudSmith. So what comes next? Like, what, how we would we then take this, you know, you mentioned staging to release repository. What would be the next, the next part in our, in our workflow, Tom? So the next stage, right, at this point, we will have uploaded an image. Um, we've created a, a, a package. We verified it with Snake. We've uploaded it to CloudSmith, and we've created a Docker image from everything at that point. So now everything lives in our staging repository, and we're looking to kind of OK things before it gets promoted into a production. So you may need to hit refresh on the UI. There's a there's a second uh, second step has appeared above. And, and true demo fashion, these things, you know, they line up. But um, so we've utilized uh, Circle CI to to do uh, an approval step in this in this position, uh, which is a great feature. It allows us to be able to to, to give a manual intervention step. Uh, prior to to doing something that could be potentially risky. So in this case, we're talking about uh, putting a, 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 something that's just been created, something that's just been built into a production environment. It's obviously something that we want to, we don't take lightly. So um, with that, uh, the, the next step is, is to essentially approve that if you want to want to do that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and this is, you know, there, there are multiple ways uh, in which you can do this, right? Um, uh, common ways we've seen in the past is perhaps to call out to Slack or some other kind of system uh, using some of the Circle CI uh, orbs in order to do so. And they help facilitate and make, make this process uh, seamless. Um, but with the approval, uh, we're at the promotion stage of this application. And from here on out, out, we're able to take that asset and put it into our production environment. So at that stage, um, we verified it's all good. Everything's looking great. Um, how do you get your stuff out of that repository, right? Well, to get things out, our best practice is in general to use entitlement tokens. So you can use sort of, uh, you can have users, you can have public repositories, but for private repositories, our best practice would be for entitlement tokens. Basic question coming in hot, yeah. Tom. Uh, sure. <laughs> uh, what does an entitlement token do? Is it is it like a password or, or set of credentials? Yeah, in a, in, a, in a nutshell, but but sir, there's a lot more to it than that. Good good catch. <laughs> um, it allows you to ultimately to control your stuff and, and who has it, who has access to it and where it can go. Um, you can get reports on it. So you can get reports on the number of downloads, perhaps, the amount of bandwidth has been confused. So if you happen to be selling software, for example, you can get visibility of if someone's abusing a token or something, someone's went rogue, and perhaps uh, this token is being misused and, and out in the wild somewhere. Um, but you can also apply constraints to it via filters. So I could, for example, as part of my deployment, give uh, container D within Kubernetes uh, permission to pull an image to do it instant to bring up a pod. Um, or perhaps I could give Terraform exclusive access to the repository just to retrieve Terraform modules. So the choice is ultimately yours with them. We, we try to empower our users like the whole way through the stack, but certainly when it comes to the deployment piece, these things are quite powerful. Uh, they're the recommended approaches. They're, they're a read-only way to get your stuff out of the repository, um, and they can be filtered and constrained throughout. Uh, we obviously like all of this stuff, right? We, we recommend this stuff is cycled. So, you know, where possible, where it makes sense, uh, refresh these tokens. They could be done through the UI, the CLI, API, or Circle CI, you know, either way. <laughs> This is this gets my my gears turning, right? Gonna go slightly off script here, but this this approval process is really interesting because we built our application, it got pushed into our staging repository, and then you've you have this approval to promote it and declare this artifact production ready, effectively. But you could you could apply the same logic to security testing as well as other activities. This concept of acceptable risk. Brian, to your to your question earlier about setting different severity levels for the sneak orb, if you don't necessarily want the sneak orb to halt your pipeline in the case of a vulnerabilities, you can still use these types of manual approvals to say, ah, well, it did find some low severity issues, but that's okay. We're gonna still let this artifact be promoted. Or and and this 
allows you to set up different tolerances for deploying an application maybe to an internal staging environment that's not customer facing and is not exposed to the internet and set up more strict rules toward a production environment that is exposed to the internet that is customer facing where those risks are much more important to address so really cool mechanic here that that we've displayed with this with this approval because it could have been used to let the pipeline continue even though the sneak job failed so. what you could even do on top of that is um set up the approval to only work if someone is tied to a certain security group in github so if you want to you know allow someone to press the button but like maybe not just intern um to come in and hit the approval because you know in that want someone to go look at it you can just gate it there too so that's a really cool cool thinking yeah absolutely so to kind of recap there's something there's a lot of things that that we didn't show but you know for for the audience what we wanted to demonstrate is like the workflow lives on circle ci in circle ci you have these orbs that allow you to extend you know the tasks that are running as part of your workflow in this case for this demonstration we showed two orbs first the orb for sneak that allows you to test you know the open source the code you, we could have scanned the container we didn't show that today we could scan the infrastructure as code all of this can be done with our with the sneak orb but then we also showed the cloudsmith orb and some of the invisible functionality that wasn't shown with CloudSmith is what Tom mentioned, you know, knowing that the applications dependencies are coming from a known trusted good source. But then also using the orb to control that promotion of an artifact from staging to production ready is a way to ensure that whatever you're deploying in production, you really know where all those bits of your supply chain tom i loved your iphone analogy like showing that you know where the chassis came from where the main board came from where the screen came from have that kind of provenance that's very very powerful and necessary to ensure that the software you're running isn't going to compromise you nobody wants to be the next case study on a data breach leaking customer data or anything so Thank you all for for helping put this demonstration to, together. I hope my recap captured uh, most of what we showed. Ryan, Tom, is there anything you you'd add? I think so. Um, personally, like Thomas, I think we've we've covered a, a good bit of ground here today. Um, you know, like you say, having provenance of what's happening across a build and deploy pipeline is crucial you know that that is that is we're all on this webinar today because that's something we we firmly believe as individuals and, and the companies in which we represent um the provenance trail you know it, it it starts in one tool right we we think of the mentality of chef left like you like you you say you know the earlier that you catch a vulnerability or an issue the impact weakens right you know if we're able to identify something that's happening all the way over here it's no big deal. We go, okay, let's bump it, let's fix it, let's move on. If something happens the whole way to the right of that platform deployment, where it's out in the wild, the customers are using it, it's like you say, you can end up a, a case study, right? You can end up where this deployment has hit hundreds of thousands, maybe maybe more users, right? It's it's an, it's on systems all over. And, and at that point, the impact in order to try and control and mitigate that uh, becomes significantly more challenging. So uh, these are these are strategies right these are a bunch of strategies presented by us today but they're most certainly not everything that we should be doing um ultimately it's about kind of provoking discussion and 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 trying to shift um the mentality you know we're already there right in the sense that uh, most of most of our audience members will most certainly be doing continuous integration to some degree they'll almost certainly be doing continuous security to some degree and continuous delivery this is about kind of meshing all that together and going, let's think about this holistically as, as, as a pipeline and what steps we can do to, to mitigate this from ever happening again. Absolutely, thank you for that, Tom. I would try to chime in, but that was so elegantly put by both of <laughs> y'all, so <I'm, laughs> that was perfect. Awesome. So real, that was uh, what we had for the, the demonstration. You know, I appreciate the back and forth, the engaging conversation, you know, the, the questions that were asked, I feel like added up value to what we were displaying. So before we, you know, to kind of recap what we what we showed, right? We showed how you can configure Circle CI. 
uh, that config that config yaml file if you look at the github repository i look up sturdy waffle it's a very hard to forget name but that github repository has the circle ci yaml that we used for today's demonstration and workflow if you need some inspiration but we saw how you can orchestrate this entire workflow including integration security packaging and delivery entirely from from a yaml file you can use those you can use orbs to add functionality from tools such as sneak and cloudsmith into the circle ci workflow without having to write everything from scratch so definitely check out the, those two orbs from the sneak side you saw how the sneak orb you can use it to fix uh, security issues in this case we demonstrated an open an issue in an open source component but the, the sneak orb goes beyond that. If you'd like to also scan your containers for vulnerabilities, or if you have Terraform, CloudFormation, or Kubernetes YAML files, you wanna scan for configuration issues, you can do all that with the sneak orb. And then you, we showed how you can use CloudSmith to you know, construct that trusted golden repository and to, get, and to control how artifacts are promoted and declared production ready as part of, as part of these workflows. So thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Tom, for helping put together this, this demonstration. It's been like so much fun to put this together with you. I guess uh, we can, before going into the Q&A, just leave our, our audience with some calls to action, right? Like uh, just all these offerings, try them. Seriously, try them for yourself. Like log into Circle CI, build your delivery pipelines and play with uh, how you can run your tests and integrate your function, unit functional integration tests, like practice your CI. Uh, check out CloudSmith, uh, build that secure cloud native repository and integrate it into the Circle CI pipeline using both the CloudSmith org as well as you know, the capabilities that it provides. And of course, you know, also check out the Sneak Orb. There's a free account that you can sign up for, it gives you a free scan allowance. You can replay this entire demonstration that we did today. Uh, on with your own applications. Uh, for the slides, we have included some additional uh, resources here for the audience. So if you'd like to read a little bit more about what it is that, that we do, uh, please check out these resources. But with that, I think we're ready to move into any questions that our audience might have from our interactive demonstration. So wondering, have we gotten any? And as a reminder to attendees, you can drop those questions directly into the Q&A section in your Zoom. We must have blown everybody's minds. Like, and just in a perfect <laughs> manner. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not, I'm not seeing any questions. Oh, we just got one. Um, what's the difference between CloudSmith and GitHub? Yeah, GitHub. GitHub, I, I, I guess I'm probably best placed to take that one. <laughs> That's a great question. Uh, thanks very much for that. So um, I guess the, 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 the primary difference is um, when it comes to security supply chain type stuff. Um, it's the amount of exposure and the amount of control that you get uh, in order to, to put mitigating factors in that. So let's take a look even at the examples that we've seen in the in the in today's webinar where we're talking about uh, upstream sources and prioritization of those sources. Um, with CloudSmith, you have absolute full control um, of that, right? You can, you can create as many of these things as you like. Um, our repositories are polyglot. In other words, we, we support more than one format in a single repository, and that enables us uh, to have our customers use our service uh, like we've demonstrated today in a kind of environment by environment basis. And so the usefulness of that is you can have you know, particular permissions for a staging repository completely separate from a, a production repository. The, the world's your oyster with it, right? Um, it's ultimately about empowering control. Uh, of, of the users of CloudSmith, so the people that are actually going to be uploading packages, uh, the people that are going to be uh, performing you know, operations with those packages, and then once it gets to the south side and it comes to delivery, uh, where those things go. So we provide very, very granular controls 
um, in order to allow you to access your packages. As we touched on at the end of the webinar presentation, um, you can create entitlement tokens on a repository by repository basis, and they're very, very powerful. Um, we have customers that use us. Uh, some customers, for example, will use us exclusively for internal development purposes, and many others will use us for distribution. You know, take Font Awesome, for example, who use us exclusively for uh, distribution of their, their glyph sets. They're massive. The, the, the amount of use that, that they come across is obscene. And uh, one of the big challenges that they have is identifying you know, who are the bad actors that are, are taking the data out of their service? Um, because many times, you know, particularly for distribution pieces, there is the fear that a license key can be repurposed, uh, perhaps shared amongst users, that kind of thing. Uh, we give Font Awesome and customers who use the service the full visibility and provenance of what's happening with their software so that they can make the decisions of, okay, well, it's pretty clear that there's there's something funny going on here. This is being accessed, you know, from a hundred unique locations. It's being accessed from a thousand different IP addresses. And so it's about empowering users with that element of control. Um, ultimately, that, that that's the gist of it, you know, but in essence, keeping everything in the same place, giving you the power to, to, um, to, to control your supply chain um, through the use of upstreams, through the use of signatures, signing, all that good stuff. Um, there's, there's, that's, that's an, in essence, it. There's, there's significantly more, but I don't want to talk too much and consume the entire rest of the webinar. Um, by all means, if there's nothing we're talking about here that, that, that doesn't resonate or you need more information, please reach out, even to me directly, if you'd rather not speak to support. Um, our details are on the, on the slide deck anyhow. Okay. So awesome. what if we? <laughs> I think we, we just got another question uh, from Usman. So how do developers and security folks work together when it comes to alerting there is a vulnerability found in the software, keeping in view the shift left paradigm? So great question. And so this can, new vulnerabilities are disclosed every day, right? And so just, just because a pipeline passed today, you know, taking in context, the demo we just showed, our pipeline may have passed right now, but if an hour from now a vulnerability against that package was disclosed, next time that pipeline executes, we'll be right back to where, where we were. So how does uh, this turn into action towards the developer? Well, one thing that, you know, and I'll quickly hop back into the into the, the Circle CI UI for, for this bit, but one thing that, that we do uh, to try to make this, the, in a developer workflow is we actually show, and this is the test that passed, so that's not a good one to show, but when it fails, we do demonstrate the fix, how, how this component was introduced, right? So right in the CI pipeline, you know, a developer could get alerted um, because, you know, Circle CI has webhooks that can report information back to GitHub as pull request checks. Uh, or as commit checks. So in through the form of, of those checks, a developer can be alerted, yo, something broke in your pipeline. And in the pipeline execution logs, they can then see, ah, like here's what I actually cost it. That's one way. Another way is as we saw in the, in the demonstration, it is possible for Sneak to automate the process of opening a pull request that can to fix the vulnerability. So it would show right here, this is where we used to have the vulnerability, not anymore. But if we go back to that, that previous snapshot where we did have the vulnerability, what we saw today in the demonstration was how we opened a pull request. So a security person uh, with access to sneak could potentially open this PR. And since it creates a separate branch, it won't just commit it straight to the master branch. It, when it creates a separate branch, all a developer has to do is check out that branch and you know test it, make sure all the tests work correctly. So in this case, we're helping it become a team exercise. So either the developer finds out because a pipeline failed or a security person takes a proactive action and opens a pull request on behalf of the developer so the developer can start verifying that the, that the, that the issues have a fix. Those are two potential ways that, that it can happen. Now, of course, there's there's other ways to do it, right? A, a security person could use the Jira integration to create a Jira ticket on behalf of the, you know, for the developer to fix this, 
or they could just use the alerting functionality within within Sneak, where if there is a new vulnerability disclosed, it will show you in the UI, hey, there's new vulnerabilities for your projects. So there's a plethora of options uh, for you know encouraging that that team exercise. Go back here. That was a great question. Any others? We probably have time for one more. While we wait for that last question, you know, uh, Tom, Ryan, it's, it's been an absolute pleasure like putting this demonstration together with you. Thanks for, you know, uh, joining forces with us to, you know, to spread the love and share the message for how developers can speed up their, their delivery cycles while keeping their applications secure. I appreciate it. And Likewise. getting waffles. It's been a pleasure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> for, for those who want to know the true story of that, it was an auto-generated Docker image, right? A Docker <laughs> container that started up. And we looked at it and thought, wow, that looks great. <laughs> why, why isn't there a company that exists with this name? So, yeah. So, yeah. Got one last question uh, from the, our same Usman. Thank you for the engagement. Uh, so how do you see the future of developer security? You know, the future is one where developers are empowered to own more parts of the stack. You know, before there used to be this really clear line of responsibility where developers would write code and pick their open source and they would then deploy their application into a golden image uh, provided by their operations or IT department. But now with the rise of the cloud, with the rise of containerization, with the propagation of open source, particularly for serverless functions, uh, developers now have more responsibility over the stack. You know, the choice of base image is a, a developer declaring that in their Docker file. The infrastructure that's on the cloud is a developer declaring that it in, in Terraform manifests or CloudFormation manifests or Kubernetes YAML files. So before where there used to be this very divided line of what developers did and didn't do, now that infrastructure is becoming part of the application. So the future of developer security is one where developers can confidently use all these new exciting and empowering technologies confidently and securely where they have the tools needed to manage security themselves with guardrails set up by their other stakeholders the security team their operations team so, and you know what tom demonstrated today with cloudsmith is definitely part of that as well where a developer knows where the artifacts they're using are coming from where you know, all their artifacts are being pr promoted and, and declared production ready. So hopefully that helps. Thank you, Tomas. And big thank you to uh, Tomas again, Ryan and Tom for their time today. Uh, and thank you to everyone who joined us for today's webinar. Um, as a reminder, this recording will be on the Linux Foundation YouTube page later today. And we hope to see you at future webinars. Have a wonderful day, everybody. Thank you all. Thanks everyone.